Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to our audience here and our audience online, which I understand was approaching 100 people this morning. So it's great to know that, that um, we're a bigger group than we would know. I'd now like to introduce our second session this afternoon, starting with our first speaker, Connor Hamm, who will be introduced by his advisor, Saloni Mathur, both of whom are joining us from the University of California, Los Angeles. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm told I can do this to present. Thank you, Rebecca. Welcome back, everybody. It's nice to see you all here in person. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the, af for the afternoon, uh, Connor Ham. Connor is a doctoral candidate in art history at UCLA working under my supervision, I'm proud to say. He and I, however, have also both benefited a great deal from the training offered by my colleagues, Stephen Nelson and Del Upton in particular, both specialists in the history of African-American art and architecture and members of Connor's doctoral committee in spite of their retirements from our department during the course of your um, degree there. Um, working at the intersection of visual, environmental, black studies and post-colonial theory, Connor's research focuses on the trajectories of modernism in the American South. The title of his doctoral dissertation is Coastal Modern Art and the Low Country After the Civil War. And prior to his arrival at UCLA, Connor completed an MFA from the Art Institute, uh, sorry, Institute of Fine Arts in New York. And he has also worked as an intern at LACMA, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and as a research assistant to the artist Charles Ray. So please join me in welcoming Connor. Uh, thank you, Saloni, and thank you to the Getty for having me here to present my research and giving me an excuse to wear my suit and Thank you to my fellow participants for being so lovely. And lastly, thank you to all of my friends who are that rowdy bunch in the middle row who are here to support me. So, without further ado, I shall begin. Magnolia Plantation and Gardens enjoys the peculiar distinction of being South Carolina's most visited plantation. Located a few miles outside Charleston in the muggy subtropical low country, the nearly 400 acre estate is known for its romantic style gardens. It also boasts a petting zoo, plant nursery and gift shop and offers educational tours and cultural programs. While on the main house tour, I learned that just a few years after the Civil War, the owner, Reverend John Grimke Drayton, sold much of his land and with what remained sought to cultivate a biblical garden that would, in his words, create an earthly paradise. In 1870, the Drayton family reopened the former rice plantation as a grand garden, 1870, making it the first plantation tourist site in the postbellum South. It was instantly successful and soon became a nationally known destination as can be seen by its inclusion in the 1900 edition of Bedeker's Guide to the United States, then the premier travel publication, and its appearance throughout popular culture, such as in this 1938 newspaper advertisement for cigarettes. In the early 20th century, artists, both white and black, flocked to the estate. Many of their artworks of Magnolia hang in the main house today, which functions as a museum. These include William Silva's triptych, Garden of Dreams, and Edwin and Elise Harleston's panorama, View from Magnolia's White Bridge. These artists tended to portray the estate picturesquely, but where white artists like Silva romanticized the estate into timeless landscapes, black artists like the Harlestons engaged the institution's Jim Crow era realities. 
that Silva's painting is discussed on the tour, while the Harlston's is not, raises concerns about Magnolia's exhibition strategies, to say the least. The site's slavery programming casts further doubt upon the plantation as a knowledge-producing institution that can grapple with its own legacies. Such factors lead me to ask, what are the stakes of Magnolia's touristic transformation? Once exceptional, Magnolia now typifies plantation's post-Civil War status as destinations. Yet there are no serious scholarly studies of the estate. So this presentation approaches Magnolia as a case study and is organized into three sections in pursuit of elucidating its touristic, art historical, and museological dimensions. Employing a culturally materialist ekphrasis, I contend that tourism, art, and curation create ways of seeing and not seeing plantations, and that plantations are not merely historical sites, but evolving institutions that ever since the Civil War have continued to produce antagonistic social relations and jingoistic forms of Southern heritage. Ultimately, I'm interested in how a place of enslaved labor became one of popular leisure, and in how this prevents a national reckoning with the histories and presence of white supremacy. In 1676, Thomas and Anne Drayton founded Magnolia outside the newly erected city of Charlestown. For two centuries, the Drayton family operated a profitable rice plantation. Now, although many of Magnolia's colonial and antebellum records have been lost or destroyed, this is what the plantation's landscape would have been like and the conditions the enslaved would have toiled in before its reopening. Sun-blasted, boggy, homogenous. These early 20th century photographs of nearby Mulberry Plantation also remind us that many planters actually attempted to maintain their agricultural estates well after the Civil War. But Magnolia's postbellum owner, the Reverend, embarked on a novel approach by turning the plantation into a public garden for paying tourists. He embraced the vogue romantic style, defined by horticultural eclecticism and spiritual respite. Soon enough, ornamental camellia japonicas framed floral alleys, oriental style footbridges embellished man-made ponds, and moss-laden live oaks and bald cypresses aggrandized the grounds. Magnolia's now stylish, heterogeneous landscape was held in high aesthetic esteem, as is evident by its inclusion in the 1893 publication, Artwork of Charleston, and its capture at the beginning of the 20th century by noted American photographer, William Henry Jackson. The landscape design had the effect of erasing from the plantation grounds and national consciousness the evidence of slave-based agriculture. Gone are the systemized rice paddies, present is decorous fecundity, no longer a node in the agricultural system, but a destination in and of itself. These mass-produced colored postcards punctuate the plantation's picturesque allure and give the estate an air of publicness that belies its actual exclusivity. The visual mediation of Magnolia played a key part in the estate's popularization and idealization betraying a larger cultural compulsion to salvage the image of the plantation as an institution, so as to reincorporate it and by extension the South into the national project. In Hannah Arendt's view, the society of the modern nation is, quote, that curiously hybrid realm where private interests assume public significance, unquote. And this is an idea I work with throughout the talk. The tensions between the public and the private are evident in the fact that at this time the estate maintained a whites-only tourist policy and an entirely black workforce. Two further photographs by Jackson encode the social relations animating this leisure destination. One, titled Woman Near Flowering Shrub, captures Magnolia's typical visitor, the typical tourist. The young, well-dressed white woman looks directly at the camera as her pose conveys ease and a degree of affluence. She stands by herself and casually dangles a recently plucked bloom. 
She is free to enjoy the gardens as a tourist and therefore engages in conspicuous leisure, a term coined by economist Thorsten Veblen in his 1899 treatise, The Theory of the Leisure Class. As Veblen states, quote, the characteristic feature of leisure class life is the conspicuous exemption from all useful employment, unquote. In contrast, the other photograph, titled The Caretakers, depicts Magnolia's freed workers, including Uncle Fraser on the far left and Aunt Phoebe on the far right, husband and wife who were actually born enslaved on Magnolia and continued working on after emancipation. No set of eyes meets the camera. They look downward and wayward while gripping their tools. The composition appears uncomfortably staged as if they were required to perform for the photographer tourist their ongoing servitude as freedmen and women. As W.E.B. Du Bois writes in Black Reconstruction in America, quote, emancipation left the planters poor and with no method of earning a living except by exploiting black labor on their only remaining capital, their land, unquote. Jackson's photographs therefore make legible the trappings of New South bourgeois womanhood while disarticulating post-Jubilee notions of the fully emancipated subject, and in so doing, make clear that the touristic plantation's enchanting place image obscures the ways in which the institution perpetuated racial and class hierarchies into the new century. This occurred uh, against the backdrop of the lost cause, the revanchist mythology which sought to glorify the legacy of the Confederacy through public works projects like Herman McNeil's monumental bronze and granite sculpture, Confederate Defenders of Charleston, which renders a neoclassical vocabulary, a nude Confederate defender standing in front of the symbolic personification of the city itself. The renovation of plantations and building of Confederate monuments were attempts to reclaim the icons of the Old South in the era of the New. Such post-bellum and 20th century developments actually produce anti-bellum heritage. As curator and theorist Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimlet observes, heritage is, quote, a mode of cultural production that has recourse to the past and produces something new. Heritage adds value to the outmoded by making it into an exhibition of itself, unquote. As forms of cultural and horticultural display, or cultural and horticultural elaboration in the Gramscian sense, heritage and tourism go hand in hand in gilding past and present ideologies into aesthetically compelling sites, symbols, and spaces. During the height of Magnolia's acclaim, white and black artists comprising the interwar movement known as the Charleston Renaissance made the estate their very own Giverne. Charleston Renaissance artists formally dialogued with Impressionism as they differently engaged the plantation's modernity. Some white artists, like William Silva, used a la prima layering that is wet on wet, while painting in plein air to lyricize the estate into timeless landscapes, as is clear in the triptych Garden of Dreams, which again hangs in Magnolia's main house. Others, like Alice Smith, embrace the liquefied strokes and soluble hues of watercolor to sentimentalize antebellum life, such as in Sunday Morning at the Great House. The escapism in these paintings accords with the site's touristic appeal and hints at a larger white Southern nostalgia. Conversely, black artists such as Edwin and Elise Harleston took on Magnolia with an inventive present-mindedness, and it is their works to which I now devote most of my attention. Edwin Harleston studied sociology at Atlanta University under W.E.B. Du Bois before training in painting at Harvard and the Boston Museum of Fine Arts School. Elise Harleston studied, soci studied photography at the E. Brunel School of Photography in New York and the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, there under C. M. Batty. In 1922, they opened a portrait studio in downtown Charleston, making her the first black female photographer in South Carolina, 
and connected them both with the growing network of black-owned studios and the wider New Negro movement. They ran their studio in a tag-team manner, whereby she would first photograph a sitter, and he would then paint a likeness from his wife's image over time, as can be seen in the twin portraits of Miss Sue Bailey with an African shawl. The doubling of the black subject here echoes the formulation of double consciousness posited by Edwin Harleston's mentor, Du Bois, in the 1903 sociological study, The Souls of Black Folk. In fact, Du Bois research wrote and published this landmark text while Edwin Harleston was his student at Atlanta University. So the painter would have surely been familiar with this concept of black subjectivity, which the theorist describes as this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body, and so on. Now, this dialectical understanding of racialized perceptions suffuses Edwin Harleston's painting, Magnolia Gardens, held at Charleston's Gibbs Museum of Art. And the image on the screen may look blurry, but that's actually the quality of the painted surface, which is significant. Here we see one of Magnolia's decorative pond bridges and the estate in full bloom. The diagonal composition pulls viewers' eyes through the scene as the thick daubs of paint evoke the luxuriant foliage and exuberant humidity of a southern summer. As with his white counterparts, Harleston depicts the estate picturesquely. Unlike them, he engages its touristic realities. The ambiguity of the figures in the background are they guests or gardeners, leisure class or working class, white or black, introduces a level of subtextual intrigue that allows for parallel interpretations and resonates with what art historian Coben Mercer calls the asymmetrical code sharing that lies at the heart of much modern African-American art. In one of his few landscapes, Harleston the portraitist goes against the grain of figuration by blurring physiognomic recognition. So the meaty impressionist brushstroke suspends the painted subject between identities and occasions in onlookers a perceptual irresolution that chimes with Du Bois' idea of two unreconciled strivings. Such ocular duplicity also appears in a panoramic photograph of Edwin Harleston at work on Magnolia painting in plein air, an image I suspect was taken by Elise Harleston, his wife. Shot from the vantage of Magnolia's white bridge, the panorama captures the painter at work and is therefore as much a portrait as a landscape. Now, the wide format photograph and previous painting are odd because at this time, black guests were not allowed entry into Magnolia. In fact, we know the Harlestons wrote the then owner requesting special admittance and were denied on each occasion. So how did they get there? How did they make these works? Well, the Harlestons must have snuck onto the estate somehow, where Edwin Harleston would have set up his easel and had his photograph taken by his wife. It's probable this is how he completed the painting we just looked at, from photographs taken clandestinely by Elise Harleston. So the likely intertextuality between the painting and the photograph points to the Harleston's determination to creatively reappropriate the space of the plantation. Importantly, this furtive act also complicates Du Bois' duality. In contrast to the caretakers in Johnson's photograph, the Harlestons own their business and control the means of artistic production, yet they are excluded from being tourists. They occupy the vexed position of the black bourgeoisie. From this place of contradiction and in-betweenness, did the Harlestons produce what I think are the most compelling, compelling and challenging images of Magnolia made by any of the Charleston Renaissance artists, one that engages the already existing charged visuality of the plantation, right? Because it was the plantation 
where racial categories based on visible difference were institutionalized. And I think the Harlestons are keyed into the endurance of that visuality, that charged visuality, into the 20th century. Whereas Silva and Smith treat the plantation as a vanishing institution, the Harlestons engage its contemporary exigencies. Both sensibilities, however, treat as an artistic concern the plantation's historical character, its being in time, its very modernity. As such, the purportedly parochial movement of the Charleston Renaissance can be said to have precipitated the larger Southern Renaissance while cementing the plantation as an icon of the 20th century American cultural landscape. And it is precisely such conditions that the Plantation Museum housing these works ought to more critically explore. And this is my last section. In addition to being a tourist attraction and artistic muse, since the 1980s, Magnolia has also operated as a museum, raising the question, how are guests invited to see the plantation while at the plantation? The differing treatment of Silva's Garden of Dreams and the Harleston's panoramic photograph, remember the former is discussed on the tour and the latter is not, indicates a curatorial bias toward racially reticent or white-centric exhibition narratives that uphold the estate's attractiveness and crucially dovetail with national myths of unity and progress. Alas, the only opportunity available to guests to hear about black experiences on Magnolia is during the award-winning Slavery to Freedom tour, though which awards this tour is said to have won, we were never told. Visitors ride a golf cart shuttle to four preserved slave cabins about half a mile away from the main house. Each of the four cabins is meant to correspond to a significant period of African-American history. The first, slavery the second Reconstruction, the third Jim Crow, and the fourth the Civil Rights Era. The only cabin curated accordingly, however, is the slavery cabin, which contains what is meant to be period objects and furniture and is enlivened by recordings of slave songs or spirituals. The other cabins are practically empty. The most we can say about the estate slavery programming is that it is well-intentioned and evocative. Visitors listen to a harrowing 20-minute narration of slave life delivered by a tour guide, handle prop versions of tools the enslaved would have used, and tour the curated slavery cabin and the other cabins. These phenomenological educational strategies are presumably meant to induce visitors to empathize with Magnolia's enslaved. Scholars like Sadia Hartman, however, question the precariousness of empathy in such affective representations, for this sense of fellowship re-elaborates the position of the enslaved. Related is the fact that the connections between the enslaved and the owners are hardly explored. One learns about the Draytons on the main house tour and the enslaved on the slavery tour with no cross-reference between them. To observe this separate but equal approach, if I may call it that, is to recognize that such institutions possess an untapped potential to both critically re-narrate black histories of and beyond enslavement and interrogate the plantation's historical and ongoing involvement in the cultural politics of race. Put differently, the plantation could transparently enunciate its own narratological shortcomings in relation to ontologies of blackness, what Hartman calls the position of the unthought. This is precisely why further attention afforded the Harlestons art is so necessary, because their formal strategies and creative practices disrupt Magnolia's picturesque image while laying claim to the plantation as a site of interruptive possibility. Much of the plantation's latent criticality arises from its institutional uniqueness. First, the plantation is a distinctive new world invention as such, it may offer perspectives on American modernity ranging from the place-based up to the continental. Second, the Plantation Museum as a museum type is singularly positioned to address the conjunctural histories of settler colonialism and racial capitalism in the long durée. And third, unlike most museums, the Plantation is both the exhibition space 
and exhibited subject. Its recursivity could upend the pretense of museological neutrality in generative ways. That said, many aspects of Magnolia operate like most other contemporary museums. It exhibits a collection, maintains an archive, charges admission, offers educational tours, relies on paid and volunteer labor, and caters to visitors while maximizing profits through features like the cafe, petting zoo, and gift shop, which were all set up in this century. At the gift shop are souvenirs that can only be described as Dixie kitsch, including mugs and printed with ostensibly cheerful dictums like the South is a lifestyle, and tea towels emblazoned with such good old boy witticisms as a good lawyer knows the law, a great lawyer knows the judge. You can also purchase a reproduction of the Harleston's panoramic photograph in the gift shop as well, and the proceeds go directly to the Drayton family. The plantation is still a private enterprise after all, one that succeeds to this day by dissembling the South's cultural stereotypes into an amusing, sentimental brand, the hokey coherence of which belies the impossible unity of the region as a symbolic space, the region of the South. Now, this brand is otherwise experienced through private events like weddings. These wedding photographs show that the estate has lately come to once again redefine its paradisiacal flair. Not unlike early 20th century postcards, these 21st century images broadcast Magnolia as a place of equal opportunity rapture. Here, the plantation attempts to absorb racial difference, the very racial differences the institution helped formalize in the name of promoting the plantation of today as a post-racial destination. Without speculating on the motives of those depicted, the motives of those behind the plantation clearly indicate a desire to once again update Magnolia's identity in keeping with larger national narratives. Nevertheless, it seems to me the married couples Magnolia should pay more attention to are Aunt Phoebe and Uncle Fraser the caretakers from the early 20th century, and Edwin and Elise Harleston. From its touristic renovation to its artistic representation to its curatorial staging and twee branding, Magnolia's place-making strategies track the transformations of plantations in the U.S. South writ large. The plantation did not fall by the wayside after the Civil War, but found new period-specific ways of maintaining relevance, raising money, and representing itself. Crucially, the continually updated image of the plantation, which is to say its narration, represents Pace Homibaba, the inherent equivocation in the discursive construction of the nation itself. The touristic plantation, like the Eden invoked by Reverend Drayton all those years ago, is a beguiling place. As Magnolia's website claims, the estate can be thought of as an extravagant liar for, quote, this is what a romantic garden is designed to do, to lie you into forgetting the normality of everyday life, unquote. Thank you. everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm TJ Demos from UC Santa Cruz, um, and I am delighted to introduce Zoe Weldon Yoakum, who's a PhD uh, candidate in visual studies in our Department of the History of Art and Visual Culture at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, Zoe specializes in global contemporary art and visual culture, approaching her case studies through eco-critical and climate justice-based methodologies. Uh, she holds an MA in art history from University of Delaware and a BA in art history and sustainability studies from University of Maryland at College Park. Um, today, Zoe will offer a presentation drawn from her dissertation project uh, entitled Atomic Afterlives, uh, Visualizing Nuclear Toxicity in Late 20th Century American Art. 
Uh, it's an extremely promising project that I'm particularly excited about, uh, especially given the way, as you'll see, uh, Zoe draws together um, acute observation with um, uh, new materialist and decolonial uh, theoretical insights grounded in political conviction. Um, in addition, she brings important new research to an underrepresented artist, Patrick Nagatani, uh, and explores his critical relation to U.S. militarism, uh, often overlooked in the ecological concerns addressed in recent contemporary art. So please join me in welcoming Zoe Weldon Yoakum. Thank you so much, TJ, for that generous introduction. And also thanks to uh, Mary, Rebecca, and Chelsea for organizing um, this symposium and everyone else that was involved in that process. The Trinity Test was an extremely vital occurrence that accelerated a dynamic new chapter in modern history. On July 16, 2020, White Sands Missile Range Commander Brigadier General David Tribula led a private ceremony to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the first atomic detonation at the Trinity site in New Mexico. The event, open to members of the military and their families, is accessible to the public through a video recording hosted on the Defense Visual Information Distribution Service, or DVIDS, a Department of Defense website aimed at supplying visual material about U.S. military operations to media outlets and the public globally. The broadcast begins dramatically before sunrise with the scene cloaked in darkness as, I, as an unidentified spokesman in a Navy suit walks to a podium adjacent to the 12 foot tall lava obelisk erected on the site at ground zero, the exact spot the first atomic weapon underwent its chain reaction. The obelisk's outline is barely visible in the growing morning light. The man at the podium, illuminated only by the glow of his flashlight, explains that the monument was built in 1965, the site was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1975, and that both forms of recognition highlight the significance of this place in its inauguration of the Atomic Age on July 16, 1945. Surrounded by what is now White Sands Missile Range, the Trinity site is where U.S. government scientists detonated the gadget. This implosion plutonium bomb is identical to the one used a mere three weeks later on Japanese inhabitants as well as non-human plants, animals, and lands in and around Nagasaki, where biological and ecological systems were thoroughly disfigured, if not wholly decimated, and are still feeling the repercussions today. In recognition of the first atomic test at Trinity, the earth-shattering event that preceded Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and that marked this and all time afterward, the obelisk was to be illuminated at exactly 5.29 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, symbolically replicating the moment the gadget burst apart and split the morning sky with light equivalent to what lead scientist on the project, J. Robert Oppenheimer, described as, quote, the radiance of a thousand suns, end quote. In the David's recording of the anniversary event, the man with the flashlight walks away from the podium. After some time at the edge of the frame and still barely visible in the darkness, he stoops down, fiddles with a surge protector, and triggers a massive spotlight that starkly illuminates the obelisk. Symbolically, the first atomic weapon is detonated again. There is no sound detectable, and the camera never shows the audience or their reaction. The private ceremony turned public through online availability supports U.S. government attempts to historicize the first nuclear bombing as a thing of the past. Both the unidentified spokesman and Tribula celebrate military and technological advancements as a result of nuclear science, but avoid mentioning the immediate and ongoing death and suffering as a result of lasting radioactivity and carcinogenic threats brought about by the first test and the many others that followed. While clearly of importance to the U.S. military as a monument, the obelisk is also a central point of focus in Patrick Nagatani's first photograph in his series, Nuclear Enchantment. The image, titled Trinitite, Ground Zero, Trinity Site, was created 1988 to 1989 and features the artist in the midst of a turbulent radioactive storm at the Trinity Site. 
The photograph is one of Nagatani's elaborately constructed stage sets, consisting of a painted backdrop, three-dimensional props, repurposed photographic documentation, and self-portraiture. In the scene's background, a chain-link fence separates the Trinity site and its commemorative obelisk from the Oscura Mountains and surrounding desert. In the lower left register of the frame, the artist includes himself wearing a hazmat suit and clutching an umbrella as a sickly green foam material resembling trinitite, the radioactive mineral created when sand was liquefied and fused by the blast's heat rains down around him. In this presentation, I argue that Nagatani's Trinitite Ground Zero Trinity Site, New Mexico, illustrates an invented moment where conventional linear time has collapsed. Here, Trinitite reigns from the first atomic test in 1945, yet the site remains as it did following its designation as a National Historic Landmark in 1975, and simultaneously, the Japanese-American artist, born in Chicago just days after the bombing of his family's hometown, Hiroshima, pictures himself attempting to endure an onslaught of radioactivity at the tail end of the Cold War when he produced this image. Using art historical and eco-critical methods and drawing on the work of quantum field theorist and feminist studies scholar Karen Barad, I contend that Nagatani's photograph emphasizes that nuclear events have no punctual ending. As I discuss such a temporally and materially layered visualization of this particular atomic site and its extensive reach help illuminate the ongoingness of nuclear toxicity within and across specific locales. Indeed, Nagatani's work asks viewers to consider the first atomic test as an event that has yet to end and whose lingering trauma continues to psychologically and or physically mutate those affected by uranium mining, refining, and its fission in nuclear weapons tests or wartime detonations. It is radioactivity's lack of immediacy and invisible airborne travel that demonstrates it is not concerned with punctual stops and starts, and carefully delineated boundaries and or notions of containment prove mostly meaningless. Moreover, the visibly constructed nature of Nagatani's image, as I discuss later, foregrounds the manner in which historical narratives, like the one presented at the Trinity site's 75th anniversary celebration, are carefully crafted and visualized through select inclusions and strategic forgetting. To begin, I turn to the image. Trinitite Ground Zero Trinity Site is a large format photograph that captures a three-dimensional tableau. The work is comprised of three main components. The background consists of a photograph that has been enhanced through the application of paint, seen in the thick, dark green clouds at the top of the image, and the wash of tan and green staining the ground cover. The mid, parts and part, uh, the mid ground and parts of the foreground are densely packed with pieces of styrofoam in various shades of green resembling trinitite, which are strong on a diagonal with translucent monofilament. The obvious visibility of the hanging method calls attention to how these three-dimensional props remain suspended, as well as the overall constructed nature of the scene. The diagonal strands also create a sense of motion, indicating that the trinitite raining down is forceful, chaotic, and violent. The lower left register features Nagatani wearing protective garments, including a full head covering and respirator. He holds an open umbrella in his gloved right hand, inadequately attempting to protect himself from the Trinitite storm raining down around him. Significantly, Nagatani's eyes are fixed downward, avoiding the obelisk and the scene behind him, and seemingly focused on the path he must traverse in front of him. This work was actually created in collaboration with artist Andre Tracy. The two artists met in 1983 and subsequently embarked on six years of collaborative work before formally ending their creative partnership in 1989. Tracy, who describes herself as a painter and a collage artist, earned a BFA from the University of Iowa, pursued graduate work at the Otis Art Institute, and notably had experience creating storyboards for television and film. Similarly, Nagatani's photographic practice grew out of graduate training with Robert Heineken at UCLA and experience building models and movie set components for films such as Blade Runner and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. During this collaborative period, Nagatani also featured work in numerous individual and group exhibitions. In 1987, Nagatani began an appointment as a professor of photography at the University of New Mexico, and his move to the state furthered his interest in the many nuclear histories rooted in the so-called land of enchantment. 
Simply put, both Tracy and Nagatani had experience in visual storytelling for a mass popular audience and fine arts training. The pair's collaborative work centers on photographs of stage-like sets that convey various doomsday scenarios, with most visualizing potential nuclear detonations, re-envisioning historic weapons tests, or parroting aspects of nuclear culture with a dark and humorous lens, seen here, for example, in this 1986 work, Alamogordo Blues. Sorry, excuse me. The work is named for the New Mexico City closest to the White Sands Missile Range, Alamo Gordo, and blues refers to both the color of the subjects and their chairs in the image, as well as feelings of sadness and depression. Often, Nagatani worked on finding props and rigging scaffolding, Tracy created backdrops and painted various other elements, and both worked to hang and arrange the materials used in the images. Crucially, five images placed throughout Nagatani's 40-image nuclear enchantment series were originally staged with or conceived of in collaboration with Tracy, who then granted Nagatani permission to either recycle or actualize such works. Trinitite, Ground Zero Trinity Site, New Mexico, as the first image in nuclear enchantment, serves as an introduction to some of the critical themes woven throughout the series, namely anxiety about the ongoing and pervasive quality of nuclearity, which goes unmentioned in US military forms of memorialization. Evidenced by much of the language used at the 75th anniversary celebration, only fragments of which are recirculated here, the first atomic detonation at the Trinity site is situated squarely in the past as both a great achievement and a necessity, with the future only conceived of in terms of scientific progress, potential utopian outcomes, claims related to world peace, and of course, plentiful energy. In the photo, with his back to the obelisk and depopulated terrain, Nagatani's downcast eyes, his averted gaze, suggest both avoidance and a void with which to reckon. While the void typically means an unfilled space or an emptiness caused by loss, void in verb form, that is to void something, is to render it invalid. Nagatani mobilizes the photographic act itself, creating dynamic tableau and then freezing them into an image to reckon with a dismissal of nuclear ongoingness. The persistence of photographic visuality as an event across time resonates with Nagatani's refusal of the narrative of boundedness and nuclear finitude presented and operationalized by the US military and media, even though admittedly there is an inexact parallel between photographic fixity and the long durée of nuclear half-life. Although Nagatani created this image well before the 75th anniversary of the first nuclear detonation, plaques found on the obelisk and replicated in Nagatani's image gesture towards earlier moments and incomplete narratives of remembrance. The first and largest of the plaques affixed to the obelisk shortly after its construction declares Trinity Site, where the world's first nuclear device was exploded on July 16, 1945. Who or what did the exploding goes unrecorded in the text's passive voice. The second plaque, attached in 1975, designates the Trinity site as a national historic landmark, defined by the issuing agency, the National Park Service, as, quote, a historic landmark that illustrates the heritage of the United States and represents an outstanding aspect of American history and culture, end quote. Such nationalistic descriptions and titles conceal the ongoing radiation and countless lives lost, domestic and abroad, human and non-human, as a result of the first atomic weapons detonation and the solidification of the US nuclear weapons program. The framing of the Trinity site by way of the obelisk, the plaques, the ceremonies by US military personnel, and by extension, the US government, attempts to represent the past in a way that is distancing and creates a buffer between initial and subsequent acts of nuclear violence, their related trauma, and present day lingering impacts. As art historian and American studies scholar Allison Fields writes, quote, although monuments are constructed to provide a resolution of the past in physical form, they often have the effect of freezing memories in time and reinforcing official narratives of healing and closure, end quote. U.S. military and government entities seek to establish clear boundaries between the event and the memorial by framing the Trinity test as a vital occurrence in the past. 
Nagatani's image, however, refuses that distinction, and instead, the artist collapses the event and memorial into a single frame, indicating that no such boundary exists. Indeed, at minimum, the first atomic detonation continues to rupture the lives of inhabitants downwind from the blast, who for decades have agitated for acknowledgement and reparations in order to facilitate recogni recognition, healing, and closure as they battle ongoing illness. Sorry. Nagatani's image does not attempt to concretize all possible relationships with or reactions to the first nuclear detonation. Instead, the artist layers multiple moments at one location into a single image. Trinitite rains down as it did in 1945. The obelisk gestures towards 1965, the year of its construction, and 1975, the year it was awarded National Historic Landmark status, and the artist pictures himself circa 1988. He focuses on the immediate and long-term afterlife of the test and rejects visualizing a mushroom cloud imaged in works such as Bruce Connor's 1976 film Crossroads, where Connor compiled 37 minutes of, of slow motion replays of two nuclear weapons tests conducted by the US military in 1946 at Bikini Atoll. The now iconic symbol of the mushroom cloud would readily signal nuclear anxieties and likely annihilation. In contrast, Nagatani opts to reference Trinitite, a material remnant of the bomb still present at the Trinity site, a glass-like radioactive human-made mineral that can be grasped in the hand. Its inclusion offers a physical item by which to ponder invisible and internal effects of radiation on the body and the land. That the Trinitite crafted for this photo is made of another physical material, styrofoam, which too is toxic and long-lasting, only reinforces this point. By including certain aspects of US nuclear iconography while rejecting others and bringing the collapse of particular temporal markers to the center of the work, Nagatani conceptually counters dominant versions of nuclear science narratives to grapple with long-term and usually invisible slow violence spurred by atomic energy, armaments, and wastes. How does one reckon with a nuclear past, a nuclear present, or better yet, a nuclear ongoingness that often evades sensory perception? Here, I briefly turn to quantum field theorist and feminist studies scholar Karen Broad. In Troubling Times and Ecologies of Nothingness, Returning, Remembering, and Facing the Incalculable, Barad focuses on how a linear understanding of time attempts to erase the complexity of entangled events. The text complicates conceptions of temporality that frame the past that has something, uh, as something that has slipped by and is no longer with us. Implementing quantum field theory experiments regarding the motion of particles through a diffraction grating, a kind of barrier with two or more slits, Barad contends that past entanglements, particulate or otherwise, survive attempts at erasure as, quote, erasure is a material practice that leaves its trace in the very worlding of the world, end quote. Put another way, erasure is always incomplete and remnants persist. Whether acknowledged or not, the past never ends and instead continuously informs the present and future. Barad moves from particle experiments to a discussion of Kyoko Hayashi's 2010 From Trinity to Trinity, a memoir detailing Hayashi's status as a hibakusha, the Japanese term for the survivor of an atomic blast. The narrative recounts Hayashi's experience in Nagasaki in 1945 and her later journey to the Trinity site. Upon reaching Trinity, open to tourists twice a year, Hayashi suddenly realizes that those in Nagasaki and Hiroshima were not the first victims of the atomic bomb, referencing those people, plants, and animals who lived, suffered, and died in Trinity's vicinity. She writes, quote, here are my senior hibakusha, end quote. Perhaps with this knowledge, we can reconceive of the obelisk not as a monument to scientific progress, but as a memorial to innumerable dead and the void left in their place. While the void in quantum field theory is that which does not have matter, Barad notes that the void or avoidance also operates, quote, as a particular framing of an event that makes use of distance to sanitize the suffering and devastation of lives, erasing some histories of violence and not others, end quote. Official narratives locate the first atomic detonation as an event that began and ended in 1945. 
The event framed as past, that is over and done with, obscures the ongoing realities of atomic trauma, including the decimation of communities through various cancers, high infant mortality rates, birth defects, and anxiety about intergenerational and multi-species loss. Conversely, in Nagatani's image, through the layering of multiple temporal elements, Trinitite from 1945, the obelisk built 20 years later, and himself another 20 years after that, the artist highlights that those events considered the past are operating in conversation with one another and continually shape the present. Indeed, as Barad contends, what resides in the void are all those who endure despite layer upon layer of colonial and racialized violence, all those counted as other, variously marked as subhuman, non-human, inhuman, or not even acknowledged as worthy of a mark or being named. Here, instead of representing nothingness devoid of matter or that to be avoided, the void is generative. It is full of everything and holds many entities and beings whose attempts of erasure were unsuccessful. Nagatani's relationship to nuclearity from the atomic bombing of his family's hometown to the imprisonment of his father and mother at Jerome, Arkansas and Manzanar, California, respectively, during World War II, cannot be voided or invalidated through erasure celebrated as progress. <clears throat> Excuse me, as progress. The trauma, however, remains. Returning to the photograph, severed by the borders of the picture plane, Nagatani is on the periphery, an afterthought to the long-standing rhetoric focusing on innovation and technological advancement. Excuse me, advancement. But his umbrella cuts between a viewer and the obelisk. His presence in the scene and the reconfiguring of this place through a collapse of time interrupts his official and incomplete narratives of nuclear remembrance. Nagatani's image reminds viewers that the violence of the US nuclear program has not and cannot go away. As we learn from Nagatani's Trinitite, Ground Zero, Trinity site, New Mexico, while radiation mutates people, places, and things, it also transforms collective and individual memory, shapes historical narratives, and inaugurates new relationships with temporality and trauma. Thank you. Okay, um, hello everybody, um, good afternoon. And it's my absolute honor to introduce my fabulous graduate student, um, Kathy Foley Meyer. I am her dissertation advisor, I'm Bridget Cooks, um, and I am a professor of art history and African American studies at UC Irvine. Kathy is amazing. Um, she's an artist, arts consultant, and PhD candidate in visual studies at UCI. Her work is inspired by the history of the African diaspora and explores themes of interconnectedness, memory, visibility, and transparency. She received her MFA in the writing program in critical studies at CalArts. And her, um, sorry, two of her mixed media works, uh, one titled In the Wake with the Bones of Our Ancestors and another titled Privilege Grid Number Three, were recently added to the collection of the National Academy of Sciences. As an arts consultant, she worked on a corporate social responsibility program for a corporation in the global finance sector and also provided services to arts organizations serving black communities in Los Angeles. Kathy is an avid arts advocate who served on the board of LACE, the Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibition Space from 2011 to 2019 and the last three of those years uh, was spent as chair. She also served on the board of the Museum of Neon Art and is currently on the advisory committee for Fulcrum Arts. She was part of the artist selection and advisory committees for Metro Art and the Expo Metro line here in Los Angeles and has served on grant panels for the LA County Arts Commission. Kathy is currently the co-host and producer of the podcast titled Outside, Inside Radio a program created by the Prison Arts Collective at San Diego State University that highlights the creative work of justice-impacted and formerly incarcerated individuals. 
Broadcasting from Pomona College of the Claremont Colleges via KSPC at 88.7, the podcast is shared with incarcerated populations in California and is also available on Spotify. Today, Kathy will present research from her dissertation titled The Art of Ocean Memory, Exploring the Temporality and Territoriality of Blackness. Please welcome Kathy Foley-Meyer. Good afternoon. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Ready to see that? Um, I'd like to thank Chelsea Anderson for her assistance and the Getty for the opportunity to present this aspect of my research, and also to Dr. Cooks and Dr. James Nisbet for their nomination of me for the conference and for their support in general. I'm dedicating my talk today to my friend and colleague, Ella Turan, who left us much too soon. And I'm starting with a poem, some lines from a poem she wrote entitled Middle Passage. The womb that is the middle passage still has not healed, still moans with the voices of thousands of vocal cords united in cries for freedom. An energy that looms over even the calmest of waters. That energy rages under my skin, keeping me connected, reminding me that there was a before me and that there is a with me, even thousands of miles away. The lower left corner or the lower corner of American artist Ellen Gallagher's 1997 piece, Drexia, features tiny specks that upon magnification are actually the heads of black women of varying shades with their tongues sticking out. Each head has a red flip hairstyle, thick lips and blue eyes giving sidewise glances and additional eyes are floating around them just out of reach of their tongues. Atop their heads are white triangular coverings that bring to mind old fashioned nurse caps. With their exuberant expressions, the painted fantastic, fantastical figures resemble classic animation. Superhuman and whimsical, they exist without bodies, presumably in the ocean environs of Drexia, a mythical undersea civilization birthed from the bodies of pregnant African women thrown overboard during the period of the transatlantic slave trade. Drexians have superhuman strength and can breathe underwater without supplemental equipment. And their mythical abilities reflect the element of impossibility that surrounds black life a defiant existence, freedom in the ocean depths that is denied on the surface while shackled in the cargo hold en route to a colonized territory that has been labeled by those engaged in the trade as the new world. A key component of concepts of blackness is that the imaginary must eschew static concepts of placement and exist adjacent and parallel to the space containing linear time and labeled modernity. A seemingly impossible, seeming physical impossibility, but the impossibility of existence is also a hallmark of blackness. The linear time space, labeled the real space, is one occupied also by a microbial presence. So, if the Drexian ocean floor is positioned as a territory for blackness in this underwater universe, and the ship crossings of the Middle Passage become a point of origin and return of life deposited into the sea, then upon their entry into the ocean, the black bodies tossed overboard are immediately transformed into sustenance for the animals and microbes that reside there, while at the same time adding to the populace of Drexia. The cycle of human beings boarding ships, departing from land, and then a portion of those taken on board being tossed into the ocean prior to reaching their land destination is repeated over and over again for the hundreds of years that comprise the slave trade, a drumbeat of the depositing of human DNA into the ocean's waters of the globe. The notion of repetition is also a recurrent theme in Gallagher's work, as noted in Orbis, the slimmest of the five magnetic volumes, as in held together by magnets, that comprise murmur the printed version of five films Gallagher made 
in collaboration with Edgar Klein that contains an essay by Kaumann Magolia Leith that notes, quote, more than most artists, Gallagher recognizes that at the heart of reputation is not sameness, but difference. Each repetition of a given motif is also the inauguration of that motif into an altered context. We are therefore left with the altered context that is the embodiment of black existence, proximity to death, social and otherwise, and the altered context of the sea, forever transformed by the introduction into it of uncountable black lives. The moment that the body is submerged is a moment of transformation, as is the eventual entry into residence time, a completely separate temporal frame. As, des as described by the scholar Christina Sharp in In the Wake on Blackness and Being, those Africans who did not survive the Middle Passage are now in residence time in the ocean, scattered across the route surface and the depths below. Residence time is a term of art in the scientific realm that refers to the amount of time it takes for something immersed in the ocean to be completely consumed by it. As Sharp notes, quote, around 90 to 95% of the tissues of things that are eaten in the water column get recycled, end quote. And she also notes that the ocean floor contains benthic organisms that can consume the body of a living being and that, quote, the atoms of those people who were thrown overboard are out there in the ocean even today, end quote. As the bodies drift downward toward the sediment, which in some instances lacks exposure to light and contains its own methods of dissemination and preservation, they are consumed and dispersed via the sea animals and microbes that feed there and also preserved in that altered context. In this cycle, perhaps we are moving toward an answer to the questions posed by Jarrett Sexton in The Social Life of Social Death, quote, what is the nature of a human being whose human being is put into question radically and by definition, a human being whose human being raises the question of being human at all, or rather whose being is the generative force, historic occasion and essential byproduct of the question of human being in general." End quote. Ellingen Gallagher's 2000 work, 2006 work, Bird in Hand, features a being that appears to be a blend of human and sea dweller, one that is possibly transforming right before our eyes. The male presenting figure is unmistakably black and sports one leg that could be seaweed and his neck is a tangle of structured seaweed as well. Dressed in a shirt with a floppy cuff like a pirate from the 1700s, his face appears to be one in a multitude of faces and portions of his hair appear to be faces as well. He holds a bird in his left hand, his right hand is not visible, and he is surrounded by plant and animal life that gives the entire piece a sense of evolutionary movement. Gallagher's work also contains what she calls, quote, puns in the forms, end quote, so that the hair could also be the bush referred to in the proverb, as black hair is often described in this manner. This work speaks to Gallagher's penchant for cap capturing the transitory status of things, betwixt and between. The in-between space is where blackness must also necessarily reside, and it is, therefore, a space that both encourages and resists mapping and surveillance and is a locus for contradiction and precariousness. Drexio is also the name chosen by the late 90s Detroit techno music duo of James Stinson and Gerald Donald, who crafted an identity or anti-identity by masking their faces and eschewing the standard music promotion interview process. In doing so, they reject a particular kind of progression narrative that left them free to create their backstory for the creatures who can breathe underwater and act as a force against the planetary power structure. A note from their 1997 release, The Quest, throws a series of questions at the listener as to the origin of the Drexian being. Quote, are Drexians water breathing aquatically mutated descendants of those unfortunate victims of human greed? Have they been spared by God to teach us or terrorize us? Did they migrate to, from the Gulf of Mexico to the Mississippi River Basin and on to the Great Lakes of Michigan? Do they walk among us? Are they more advanced than us? And why do they make their strange music? 
what is their quest? The questions speak to an anxiety regarding that which emerges from the ocean while simultaneously naming the ocean as a physically transformative space. As Charles Mills notes in Inside Neptune's Lair, Drexia, Dystopia, and Afrofuturism, the music and mythology prior prioritized, quote, becoming over being, end quote. And the quest release also contains several illustrated maps depicting the migration of the Drexians and their music in, quote, four diasporic flows, the slave trade, migration route of rural blacks to northern cities, techno leaves Detroit, spreads worldwide, and the journey home future. Mills states, quote, a vast temporality is injected into the Drexian mythology, end quote, with these diasporic flows that register the hybridity and tumult of black modernity. From their 1995 release, Aquatic Invasion, here is a bit of a track entitled Sighting in the Abyss. That. that was a little extra. Okay. Black lives in residence time in the ocean are part of the collective cultural memory of the generations of the African diaspora and a component of ocean memory, a concept that engages both the sciences and the arts. The art and science collaborative known as the Ocean Memory Project or OM defines itself as quote, a new cross-disciplinary approach to global scale scale challenges, end quote. And its incarnation was driven by a question inspired in part by the ecological dis disasters, such as the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Namely, quote, does the ocean have memory? The question came out of the 2016 National Academy's Keck Futures Initiative Deep, sea, Deep Blue Sea Conference. OM was conceived as a cross-disciplinary blend of oceanographic research and related creative output. As noted from the OM website, quote, the ocean's capacity for telling us its many stories is boundless, end quote. Under consideration for OM is how environmental change on a variety of timelines may be recorded or memorized, if you will, quote, in the physical and chemical traits within the dynamic structure of the ocean itself, end quote. At the June 2020 Ocean Memory Conference on Genomics and Cognition, each participant was asked to submit a question, and mine was simple. Where are they? Those human beings tossed overboard during the Middle Passage, dead and alive, consumed by the ocean's ecosystem in its vast cycle of life. How can we see what is still there, but invisible to the naked human eye and to the eyes of, techno of technology capable of capturing life at a microbial level? If these bodies in residence time exist as energy for life in the ocean, how are they part of the memory of the ocean? These questions sit at the nexus of where art and science gather information and create content, content that attempts to make sense of the history of our planet and the location of human beings along the spectrum of that history. The 2018 discovery of the remains of the slaver Clotilda in the water off the Alabama coast embodies William Faulkner's thought, the past is never dead, it's not even past. As the contents of the cargo hold of the slave ship were remarkably well preserved by remaining in the muck of the river for centuries, the retrieval of the slaver and ensuing analysis of its contents will include an examination of wood and metal artifacts to determine if DNA from those captives in the hold is still present. Even if the DNA is not recoverable at present, 
the progress of the science of DNA may render it visible in the future. In thinking about the hold of the Clotilda, we can remember the words of the Caribbean writer Edouard Glisson in his text, The Open Boat, as he speaks of the slave voyages as three manifestations of an abyss. The first being, quote, the belly of the boat, end quote, which he labels, quote, a womb abyss, end quote, and the second encountered when human beings are thrown into the ocean depth with their weighted shackles speeding the journey to the bottom. The third manifestation is one of remembrance, quote, a reverse image of all that had been left behind, not to be regained for generations, except more and more threadbare in the blue savannas of memory or imagination, end quote. This abyss is part of the struggle of our present as Black people. We reach backwards in search of a collective cult cultural memory of our origins, which no longer exists if it ever did, leaving us forever at sea. As Glissant writes, quote, navigating the green splendor of the sea, whether in melancholic transatlantic crossings or glorious regattas or traditional races of yoles and gomiers, still brings to mind coming to light like seaweed, these lowest depths, these deeps, with their punctuation of scarcely corroded, corroded balls and chains. In actual fact, the abyss is a tautology. The entire ocean, the entire sea, gently collapsing in the end into the pleasures of sand, make one vast beginning, but a beginning whose time is marked by these balls and chains gone green. My questions to the Ocean Memory Conference were metaphoric responses to a problem I had been wrestling with in my personal art practice. A year or so before I began the PhD program in visual studies, I completed a series of 12 paintings inspired by research I had conducted using the transatlantic slave trade database. Each painting depicted a voyage in abstraction using the statistics from slavevoyages.org, dates of departure and arrival, the number of human cargo embarked and disembarked, the number of days spent in Middle Passage, and a large number in black representing the number of human cargo lost to the sea during the course of the voyage. In making this work, I faced the conundrum of how to represent something that is not present. To paraphrase words of advice from Miles Davis to another admission, don't play what's there, play the notes that are not there. The large black numbers at the center of each painting seemed an inadequate accounting for a life, particularly since I was borrowing the figure from the official accounting of the voyage, which did not account for human life. Rather, it was a statistic that discounted human humanity in favor of a pecuniary construct. The resulting work, 12 Voyages, was a construct that represented the loss of life, but still felt insufficient in terms of signifying or if you will, embodying the full scope of those lives lost. How can we account for the value of a life cut short, ancestral lines in the millions sacrificed to the ocean depths? It is an incalculable loss for which mere statistics are inadequate in their representation. This loss is a cultural one for descendants of the African diaspora. It has created a space for mourning that remains unfulfilled and ever expectant that a monument may be constructed. This phenomenon was illustrated by the public reaction to vicissitudes, an underwater sculpture by the artist Jason DeCares Taylor. Composed of marine compatible pH neutral and non-toxic cement, the piece depicts a circle of 26 life-size alternating figures of a boy and a girl holding hands, with the male appearing to be of African descent. The artist used local children from the area of the work's final resting place as models for the sculpture, which is submerged off the coast of Grenada. Vicissitudes is part of Museo Atlantico, an underwater museum conceived by Taylor as a countermeasure to climate change by encouraging the establishment and growth of coral reefs within, it, within its oceanic borders, by entering into a pre preservationist relationship with it in terms of installing his sculptures on the ocean floor where they gradually lose their recognizable human features as they become colonized with living coral and the other creatures in the sea who take up residence in the cement statues. 
On May 23rd, 2012, a Wisconsin Milwaukee nonprofit organization known as America's Black Holocaust Museum published an online article stating that vicissitudes was an homage to life, lives lost to the Middle Passage. And on May 30th, it published a retraction. In the short span of time between publication and retraction, the reaction contained in the online comment section accompanying the article is testament to the intense desire for a memorial for black, black lives lost to the ocean during the slave trade, to the necessity of visibility of these lives in residence time. The artist himself confirmed via his website that the sculpture was not intended as an homage, but that de declaration did not deter some commenters on the ABHM site who declared their intention to consider it so regardless. We know that artists cannot control the meaning of their work once it is released to the viewing public. And the alternative meaning of the sculpture is also reflected in the manner of ABHM's retraction. Instead of disappearing the original text, the site simply crossed it out so that the first interpretation serves as a permanent counter monument to the artist's position regarding the intent of vicissitudes. Per his website, DeCares Taylor views his art as carrying on the tradition of the land art movement of the late 1960s and 70s with its blending of, quote, environment, art, and activism, end quote. He says, the timing of installation is significant to ensure they are in place downstream before the larval coral spawning occurs, yet not so early that other sea life colonizes it before the coral can take hold, end quote. When DeCares Taylor uses terms such as diversity, and colonization on his website, he's referring to coral rather than human beings. And as part of the colonization process of the coral, the artist's human figures become less recognizable as such, and they morph entirely, they morph into entirely new and visually arresting forms of life that are elaborately fantastic and surreal. It is possible to draw a through, through line between DeCares Taylor's human figures some of them based on human beings of African and Caribbean descent, morphing into fantasy and Ellen Gallagher's superhuman water creatures defying the known abilities of human beings to exist without bodies and to breathe underwater. In placing life-size sculptures of black people on the sea floor, however, one could argue that the phenomenon of colonization of humans is being extended into new territory. For black people, there are no uncontested spaces in which to exist. It bears repeating, blackness and the existence of black people is a con constantly shifting series of contested spaces. Remembrance is a survival strategy, a necessary armor. We can therefore consider the work of Ellen Gallagher and Jason DeCares Taylor as a component of ocean memory a strategic front against erasure of a human presence on earth, even if the creation of his art was not specifically intended for that purpose. We can conceive of it as components of an ever present but shifting identity process that connects the living to ancestors who are alive in an alternate, alternate context, a fluid context that parallels that which is required to maintain solidity in contested spaces. Ocean memory is expressed in Lorna Simpton's Everything, an exhibition recently on view at Hauser and Worth in Los Angeles, which contains a large number, which contains a number of large scale canvases that reference land and seascapes containing huge rock clips, clips partially composed of printed photographic images of black women. In one work, they appear as wig style photographs an image type also utilized by Ellen Gallagher in her work, that along with columns of text appear to be part of a gigantic blue wave of water that is arising out of, arising in front of a brownish land-like territory. In another, calmer waters are depicted in a superimposed photograph in which a landmass arises out of it along with columns of text referencing womenhood, where words such as queen and Eve can be discerned along with photographic strips of black women's faces that blend into the rock-like structure. And another in which one image of a black woman sits up atop the mass, her eyes closed and her face in profile, facing out across the water as if in vigil for a ship to 
depositing more black bodies into residence time. The phenomena of women waiting by the sea for men to return is a plot point of drama and literature, but the image of this black woman could be construed as waiting for something else, for the end of all voyages of human cargo and for the recognition of black lives lost during these voyages. She could be attending the emergence from the abyssal beginnings that are centuries old. In her 2020 book, Water Graves, The Art of the Unritual in the Greater Caribbean, Valerie Loichot labels the ceremonies and customs that have evolved in contemporary art production, referencing human lives lost to water as, quote, unritual or the privation of ritual. She notes, quote, unritual is a state more absolute than even the desecration or defilement, more absolute even than desecration or defilement, since the latter imply the existence of a previous sacred object or state, a temple, a grave, a ceremonial. Unritual is the obstruction of the sacred in the first place, end quote. Washo deliberately links unritual with the undead, a state of being between life and death, where those gone without appropriate rituals persist in, persist in dwelling among and haunting the living. Occurrences of black corporeal death are often marked by unrituals, counter monuments and works of art that speak to the subjective status of black bodies in the ocean as trailing temporal strands that stretch from the doors of no return to the present. These hauntings are evident in the work of the artists discussed here. Their work both intentionally and unintentionally grapples with the ocean memory of black lives an unritual claiming a sacred space in the ocean depth, heeding the call for a recognition of lives that are temporally, literally, and figuratively fluid. Writing about the artwork related to lives lost to Hurricane Katrina and the slave trade, Luasho notes, quote, water facilitates passage and bars access. Artistic creations become dirges and requiems through their blanks and blacks, through the peace and music they contain or produce, through epitaphs, shrouds, tombs, or urns, through the offerings they make and the shrouds they throw. Naturally, they all deal significantly in water and its ambivalence. Water is their threat, need, medium, and barrier, saving grace and assassin, cleansing and toxic media. Water is a threshold between worlds such as the Americas, Africa, and Europe, as well as between the worlds of the living and the departed. Thank you. Thank you to Connor, Zoe, and Kathy for three really powerful papers. My, my mind is spinning with questions and connections.